Welcome to the Invasive Plants Ranger Program Training Workshop, brought to you by the Arboretum at Flagstaff and the Museum of Northern Arizona. Our speakers will be Sheila Murray from the Arboretum at Flagstaff, Barb Phillips from the Museum of Northern Arizona, and Jan Busco, also from the Museum of Northern Arizona. This workshop will include a quick summary of our project, how volunteers can be involved in their neighborhoods, how to use Gaia for weed surveys, how to identify target species, and finally, the tools and methods of removal. The goals of this project are to find large areas of weeds on public and private lands and then treat them with herbicide or with hand pulling crews. Also, we want to engage the public with trainings such as this uh, to find smaller areas of weeds and then to help neighbors with site visits and guidance on organizing their own weed pulls. This is a map of the project area. The project area is south of the 2019 Museum Fire, which is located in the red diagonally shaded area. The project area boundary is the dark blue line. Because the project area is so big, we've divided it up into specific neighborhoods. For example, we have the Schultz Pass Magdalena area, Mount Eldon Estates, Sunnyside, etc. Within each neighborhood, we would like to recruit a volunteer neighborhood lead. If you are interested in taking on a more active role, please consider becoming a neighborhood lead. Neighborhood leads will be asked to attend an in-person demonstration, which will be scheduled throughout the summer. And then after the training, leads will then coordinate with us on the areas that need surveys and treatment, and then also will be empowered to organize and conduct activities in the area. Volunteer time is valuable, and the current match rate is about $25 per hour. This helps to convey to our partners that the project is supported by the community. A form will be included with your registration and any activities such as viewing webinars, attending in-person demonstrations, performing surveys, attending weed pools, hosting weed pools, or any other restoration activities can be included on this volunteer timesheet. If you have any questions, please give me a call. In this section, we will teach you how to help us collect data on where weed infestations occur. Survey information guides our decisions on how to treat areas of weeds. If the area is quite large, our project has funding to pay professionals to treat with herbicide. If the area is smaller, we can also pay hand crews, such as ACE, to come through and pull the weeds, or we can have helpful folks like you volunteer to pull the weeds. Surveys are compiled into a GIS database and our partner, Natural Channel Design, will create maps. As you can see, the surveys are not quite complete. So as volunteers in this project, we can coordinate with you if you'd like to help collect this data. There are three easy ways to contribute survey data. You can use paper maps, you can use your phone camera, or you can use the Gaia app. Paper maps of the area can be printed ahead of time, and you can record your progress, indicating the route that you walked, as well as making note of where you encounter any weeds. Please write down what weeds you find and estimates of how many you find. Also remember to track your time for the timesheet. Your smartphone has built-in GPS capability and can embed the location details into any photographs that you take. The only requirement is that you have your location services turned on. If you have an iPhone, they can be found in the settings menu underneath privacy and then location services. 
move the slider to green to turn them on. In an Android phone, they are also found in the settings menu under location, and at the top you set use location to on. Once location is turned on, every photo will then have the GPS data embedded inside. Gaia is a free app for your smartphone that is very useful for hiking, navigation, and also for this project. Within Gaia, you can record waypoints and you can also record your movement with tracks. When you find a patch of weeds, you can create a waypoint. Select the Create Waypoint Near Me and it will give you the option to name your waypoint. Within the waypoint name, you can include the weed species and an estimate of how many occur at this location. In this example, I have included the title nap to describe napweed and the number three to indicate I found three napweed at this location. While you are surveying, you can record your movement with tracks. The record button is near the bottom of your screen and once pressed, it will create a red line of where you walk. You can take waypoints as you go. The record function will still continue running in the background. When you are finished, you tap the icon again and then select Finish Track. The track is now saved. To send the data, find your waypoint or track on the screen and then tap the little eye that's in a circle. Then you scroll to the export option. You can choose to either text or email. With any of the survey options, please send the data to me at sheilamurray at thearb.org. Please send me photos of your hand-drawn maps, photos of weeds, or any of the Gaia information. So I am just going to talk about a few of the po possible um, species that are in our area. There, there could be others that you find uh, that are invasive species, um, but these are the main ones that we're concerned about because of um, it being adjacent to forest service land. So we're also concerned about species moving upwards into the forest where it just burned and especially so because they are doing a lot of work adjacent to our project area as part of the watershed project immediately adjacent to the city. So I, right now I'm up in the watershed area adjacent to the city. Um, on that previous slide, I wanted to show you the size of the um, area. It goes from the right side of the photograph to the left side of the photograph and it's about as far as you can see in the distance, this is one Dalmatian toad flax um, patch that's as big as a couple of houses. It's an amazing size patch that's out there in the forest already. Um, so the next slide, thanks. Sheila's managing the slides, so. <laughs> uh, Dalmatian toad flax, most of you probably are already aware of, of what it looks like. Um, it used to be in the Scrophulariaceae, now it's in the Plantagenaceae, a name change kind of thing. Um, it's from southeastern Europe um, in what is now Croatia, and it used to be Dalmatia. It is a perennial plant um, with um, big flowers on it. You can see they're very pretty flowers. It was brought over primarily as an ornamental in people's gardens. And it is beautiful when it, it first starts flowering and then it just gets sort of ugly after a bit. Um, if, <laughs> if it's not a managed plant, it, it becomes uh, not too pretty to see. But it is uh, fairly distinctive. And um, so it is a, a concern because it does, can cover massive areas in, um, uh, especially those areas that have a lot of disturbance. So after they do treatments and they do burn areas to burn up the, the debris from the fires, um, it comes in there and because it gets increased nitrogen, it also gets very large, produces thousands of seeds. <laughs> um, 
So th this has um, always been a, a one of concern. It's been in our area since about um, uh, 1940 was the first record by Deaver of Deaver Herbarium, and it was on the NAU campus. Uh, so it's been there since then. It's been at the Museum of Northern Arizona. It was first collected by Mary Russell Farrell Colton at the Colton Ranch in 1957. And the museum is part of our area um, of concern here. Uh, so it has been around a long time, probably not anywhere near as abundant as it is today. And so it is starting to take off. And this is true with a lot of invasive species. They come in very slowly. They get used to the environment. They find the habitats that work for them, and then after a while, they get into conditions that help them explode in, in their environment. So this is after greater than 50 years, this plant has adapted to the Flagstaff area and is now really taking off. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as I said, this habitat can be disturbed. It's also around in, in the towns, in people's yards, occasionally on the streets. Um, sidewalk areas and things like that. It is possible to pull um, the plants before they flower and just put them out on the ground. You can see at the right they have rhizomes that connect between little plants, but if you pull very gently you can get a lot of that and that takes away a lot of nutrient for these plants. And I've found that if I go back on the same trail for say five years and pull consistently what I see, um, it really does diminish the populations a lot. So hand pulling does work. Um, herbicide can work too, but it, it's harder because it has um, waxy leaves and uh, that uh, it takes special kinds of herbicides to um, get through those waxy leaf uh, types. So um, this is one that you could survey for and pull it at the same time. And actually this is a good time of year to pull it because it's just beginning to flower. Um, so you can pull and leave the plants there. Later on, if you pulled, you'd have to bag them and uh, haul them out. Um, next. Um, Scotch thistle is um, one that is coming in a lot around the museum area. Um, here's the plants um, when they're full grown first. Um, very large flower heads. Um, the Inset at the right shows the spines on it. Those are actually quite large spines and a nice pinkish color on the, on the flowers. And they're, they're, the plants themselves can grow to be like 12 feet tall <laughs> and they can fill in beside each other so you can't even go um, through them. Uh, a big thing on them is the, um, I don't know if I can point at it, um, but the spines go down the stem so that you would never want to grab a hold of the stem of this plant. Um, it's, it's very formidable looking um, in that respect. This shows young plants coming up in a field um, where they had been eliminated the year before, supposedly, um, but because it's a disturbed area and the seeds can be persistent for like 15 years or more uh, once they fruited. This, this we've gone back to every year and eliminated the plants before they fruit and we still have young plants coming up. Um, mm -hmm. And these are very large. If you look at these, that one on the right is probably knee high already and it's starting to bolt. There's a flower in there that you can start to see. So, um, they are, are, tend to be biennial, and which means the first year usually they don't flower, but they can. And, and then the second year, you have a lot of flowers coming along. Um, and Jan can talk about how we um, work with these, but uh, this is just an example of how it comes in. Next one. This uh, shows the leaves, and they're very spiny. Uh, they also are covered with some white hair and it gives it a very whitish appearance. And these leaves are as big as your foot or bigger. Um, if you have very big feet, they would be as big as your feet. <laughs> so think of, 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 of a thistle that has leaves of that size when you're looking at this. These are very big leaves. Um, and that's a characteristic of the Scotch thistle. 
um, a very, very tall, very big leaves and amazing stems with spines on them that you would never want to grab. Okay, so that's a common one in Schweitzer Valley and in, in Schultz Creek Valley. Um, it could come in other places and it's been along roadsides too. So um, one to keep look up, out for. This is actually Big LaRue Spring out by Fort Valley, but I took a picture because this was an area where they restored the water to the drainage and it's a very hopeful situation. Um, and Steve Monroe here is a hydrologist and he and I went out to inventory the quote native plants that were coming back in here and I found all these little thistle plants coming in. Well, musk thistle is abundant in Fort Valley um, and so uh, it had already found its way into um, Luru Springs and musk, musk thistle looks fairly similar to scotch thistle except if you look at the f flowers and fruits they're turning and it's called nodding thistle because it the flower head sort of gets very heavy and, and turns downward um, and this also can get like eight to ten feet tall and doesn't tend to form as big clump as as solid a, a, an area of clump infestation but it it certainly can form very big um, plants especially in horse pastures where they get some extra fertilizer and places like that uh, so it is particularly nasty in Fort Valley and there's some on museum grounds that are um, and down in Schweitzer Valley and other places that are coming in so this is another uh, thistle from Eurasia to keep a an eye out for. Next. Yellow star thistle. Um, th these photos uh, uh, happen to be taken at the Sedona water treatment plant, so that's why it's um, red brome in the background instead of cheatgrass, but um, these were flowering there and they were are mostly in the Verde Valley, but why I put them in here is they came up to the wildcat treatment plant in Flagstaff in uh, the late 19... 98 or so we found them up here in Flagstaff and it was the uh, thing that spurred us on to developing um, a weed EIS for the Forest Service and to establishing the San Francisco Peaks weed management area was this plant right here. Um, it's a very um, uh, unpleasant plant, very spiny. Um, if, if we had a close-up of the, of the spines you'd see they're very spiny if you look off to the left of the little note yellow uh, star thistle or up above it too they're really there and um, if horses eat this they get what's called chewing disease and they actually get their tongues swell and everything and they can't eat and and they can starve to death so it's a very very bad uh, plant in that regard and a lot of these plants that we're talking about are either um, toxic in themselves or um, have allelopathic kind of chemicals in them that inhibit other plants from coming in. Um, there's, there's various uh, things. That's why they're called noxious weeds is because they are. <laughs> okay. Um, yellow star thistle is um, uh, let's see. I can get there. Anyway, um, and then the next one we have is um, thistle, yellow star thistle. Uh, diffuse net. Oh no, this is the native thistle. Okay, I put this in here just because we have abundant Wheeler's thistle in the Flagstaff area. This is under the ponderosa pines, just a general nice undisturbed ponderosa pine area. And you can see the whole area is there's a little pop up things those are all heads of, of native thistles the difference with this is you can see the seedling over there on the right how tiny it is compared to the the uh, thistle head and also um, the plants get maybe at the most knee high they don't get over a foot and a half tall or so uh, last year was a very prolific year for this thistle but it is not you can walk through there you don't have any probably walking through there you can you can touch the plants they don't have any spines on the stems um there's spines a little bit of spines on the leaves the if you if you took a tried to grab hold of probably the, the flower head you'd feel some spines but it's just not 
the degree of spininess that, that the uh, non-native thistles are. So there's several species of native thistles and we prefer that nobody goes around and tries to kill the native thistles and just leave them for the pollinators and the other animals to uh, have in their normal native habitat. Next. Okay, now we do have another obnoxious weed. This is diffuse knapweed, and uh, this has been a big focus of our surveys to find out where the distribution of this is. Um, it's especially up on McMillan Mesa and then down in East Flagstaff. It's very, uh, very abundant. Uh, this is off, off in the back side of your photo is the um, Route 66 plus Starbucks, um, the new Starbucks that they put in and the road behind that, it goes up to the Catholic Church. So these basins were scraped all off. Um, there used to be a vet there and in various um, malls and things like that. And now they've come in with knapweed and it's just full of knapweed. And knapweed turns into a tumbleweed. So that's one of its uh, concerns too, is it breaks off and can blow in the wind and um, some of the seeds stay stuck to the plants that are blowing around. So this is in the sunflower family too, just like the thistles were, but a much smaller flower heads. And if you go to the next one, we have um, close-ups. Um, this, this is how uh, you can identify it, the one on the left. It's a very diffusely branched, uh, sort of pretty little candelabra kind of plant, not very tall, um, probably about a foot and a half tall. Um, you look over on the right, you see the uh, flower, the top one, the white flower, and the um, spines on the underneath it. It's not a very big flower at all, um, but uh, it, like I said, it blows in the wind, it drops these seeds, and it just has, it's allelopathic, so it does inhibit other plants that come in around it. Um, there are a lot of other small composites uh, this, in the sunflower family that can, for much of their life, look fairly similar to the species. So uh, that's one reason we need good training on this species because it has a lot of lookalikes for, it, for the novice kind of person. Um, another plant is the spotted knapweed. If you look at that lower figure, it looks very similar to the um, diffuse knapweed. We don't have it, it's not near as common. Uh, the places I know it around Flagstaff are on the forest and not in, so far I haven't really seen it in our project area, but you can see it has sort of spots on the phyleries there instead of uh, the spines being the prominent thing that has these dark spots and that's why it's called spotted knapweed. Spotted knapweed is a real pest up in places like Montana and Eastern Oregon and those areas. So their big pest is spotted knapweed, ours is diffuse knapweed. And here's a third, uh, another one called Russian knapweed. Um, and Russian knapweed is actually in a different genus, but it is, um, has a different kind of a habit to it in that it's connected by rhizomes under the ground. And um, so it, um, it perpetuates that way a lot more than it does by seed. Um, we had a population out at the Snowball Road and we treated it for 20 years about and with herbicides and these plants are still there. These, these are some that I just took a picture of last year. So there are a few of Russian knapweeds still left out there. As you can see on the inset photo, its fruits look quite a bit different. It doesn't have any of those spines on the, well, it's probably the bud, but you can see on the bracts and stuff like that, no spines are evident. It's all sort of roundish and everything. Because the big thing with this one is spreading by, by the roots. Um, that, that's the big way this gets around. Um, and it's also allelopathic and so, you know, inhibits plants that grow, would grow underneath it. And this is my grass finding dog. <laughs> she is out in the Schweitzer Meadow area. And this is Nikki. 
Um, and you can see a pond in the background. And this actually has a fair amount of natural um, vegetation in it. The pond is, is all natural plants, native plants in, with it. And then coming forward, we, well, we have some shrubs, and then we have western wheatgrass and some squirrel tail. And then we get into some annual bromes and then especially cheatgrass. Um, but if you look in the distance, you can see red areas. And at a certain point, the cheatgrass turns red. And those red areas are solid, pretty much cheatgrass. So you can see one big area off to the right, center, well, further back than that even. And, and then um, off to the left, smaller ones. So there's a lot of cheatgrass in this whole valley. It, it goes from the Elks Club basically in patches up to um, the museum land. And there's just a lot of cheatgrass. Um, so that's a big issue. And it's also starting to be a real big issue um, with ranchers. Um, it, uh, the other thing about cheatgrass is it inhibits other grasses. It, it, it cures out in June. And so it's a big fire danger species. Um, not only has it inhibited um, the some of the native grasses, but then it, it'll burn and it will have a return in a uh, frequency of about four to five years. So once you get solid cheatgrass stands, um, you have a big problem with fire. And it's moving up toward the forests and into the forest, mostly from the grassland. There's a close up of it on the left a little bit. Um, it's pretty distinctive once it's in fruit, um, and it, it pulls easy if, if you um, can get it before it goes to fruit. It actually does pull quite easily, um, or as, as one person said, you could cut it off as long as you recognize it, what it is and not let it fruit, and that's a good way to do it because it is an annual, and if you do that for two or three years, um, you can eliminate your population too, um, and that is in a way better because you're not disturbing the soil so that you're creating more seed bed. <clears throat> and the seeds are persistent up to about five years or so in the soil. The grass at the, the right is jointed goat grass. And um, <coughs> uh, this is one I don't really like it a lot. Of, it's, it's because I never notice it until the seeds have already dropped off and the seeds break apart the uh, each separate little clump uh, thing there along that you see sort of a joint that they break off and fall on the ground and then it's like you need a vacuum cleaner or something to get them up they're 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 just there um, so this it was not very much present in the Flagstaff area for a long time it um, I noticed it in my yard probably 10 years ago and now um, Jan tells me there's a lot at the museum. Um, we're, we're just getting a lot more of that jointed coat grass. Now this is uh, foxtail barley, the sort of very light yellowish green color. And you can see it's coming in amongst the cheatgrass. So that's good. <laughs> um, it is a native plant. It does have long um, uh, awns on it and um, so if you have animals, you have to be careful with that. Um, in a natural area, you wouldn't want to cut them off because that's the seed that's going to seed in. It is a short-lived perennial, so it's better than, a, than the annual cheatgrass. And, um, but it does have that feature. It, it flowers now and fruits now, starting fruiting out. Um, the other one that looks very much like it is the um, squirrel tail, and it'll fruit out a little bit later. And it is more of a perennial. It's quite a stocky perennial. And so that's a good plant to have too. Um, so coming in amongst all the cheatgrass, we do have a couple native plants um, that are beginning to come in. Uh, okay, that's the grasses. The other plant I wanted to mention is poison hemlock. Um, it is in our project area, I've heard. Uh, this picture happens to be taken at, at, at Picture Canyon. Um, it's come in there in the restoration area alongside the banks. It likes sort of moister areas and, and ditches and those kind of places. Um, it is poisonous, especially the seeds are re really poisonous. Uh, 
when you control it, you want to wear gloves and, and long sleeve shirts and washing your hands before eating, etc., like that. It's in the umbel family related to carrots and parsley, plants like that. You can see in the center uh, photo, the, there's some spots on the stems and that's a characteristic of the um, species. Um, but this is one where there's quite a few look-alike kind of plants and it would be desirable to really uh, be able to tell them apart. Not that you would want to eat any of them but out in the wild, but just this one is very poisonous and there's some others that are quite poisonous too in this family. Um, so pretty much the way that this grant was designed is with the um, hope that treatment below the fire area will prevent spread of the weeds into the burn area and drainage ex extending into the Rio de Flag watershed by wind walkers, vehicles, and animals. And so um, the first thing is that you can help when you're out. Um, a lot of the avenues of spread from um, our urban um, weed populations up into the fire area will be by foot. Um, so we have creatures like my dogs, have to get the dogs in every presentation, um, Zeta and Sirius, um, who can transport the weeds on their fur. Um, hikers, who can transport the weeds on their feet. Um, water, while it's mostly running down from the burn area, the weeds also grow within the areas and can blow up the drainages. And I think bicycles are another big one because people on bicycles have some really good mobility. So um, this is a pretty quick slide here. Um, this shows what it looks like to be doing large area chemical treatment. And as we said, it's predominantly diffuse napweed. Year one, spray. Year two, we spray again. And then after the spray has had a chance to kill off the napweed, then you can seed with native grasses. Um, the crew options, here are some pictures of some different um, crews. Um, the upper picture is an American Conservation Experience ACE crew, um, and the lower is a University of Arkansas um, volunteer team out at the Arboretum. Um, so these crews and our invasive plant rangers um, will have neighborhood weed pools and then do follow-up monitoring and continued surveys. Um, so one of the things that's really important when you that we'll cover in the trainings, but we'll just touch on here some of the things that we'll be talking about, will be how to identify your plants. And um, on the upper right, there are three pictures on the upper right, a seedling, a rosette, and then a mature plant in bloom. Those are all diffuse snapweed. So one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that we know what the plants look at all their different stages. Um, the plant on the bottom is um, Dalmatian toad flax. And of course, we're all familiar with the pretty yellow flowers and maybe after that, the little brown seed heads. Um, possibly know what the leaves look like when they're coming up from the ground before they bloom. But um, we'll also have other stages that are almost grass-like. <laughs> Well, one of the things that we um, want to cover in the training is a really important thing. Um, when we're pulling weeds, um, lots of times there are some really good native plants with them that we do, don't want to um, pull. We want to protect the natives and recognize and avoid lookalikes. So um, looking at this um, picture, what you can see on the left, on the top, is a um, bull thistle, which is an invasive that we would like to pull. And then next to it, um, our native Wheeler's thistle, which is very beneficial for pollinators. Barb showed that in an earlier slide, but you can see there the differences in the flowers. Um, next slide over to the right, or the next picture to the right, we see a young rosette of diffuse napweed. Um, it's very distinctive looking, but it's easy to confuse with a lot of plants. And so the plant just to its right is actually a wild chrysanthemum. Um, later on, another life stage of the plant for diffuse napweed, um, you can see the very open airy plant covered with all kinds of small white flowers. And just to the right of that is a close up of how to recognize um, diffuse napweed the filaries or the things that hold the flower together at the bottom have all of those nasty spines coming out of them. 
And if you go to the right, you'll see a plant that can look very much alike, which is a Brachelia. And yet if you look, it has um, very smooth fillaries, none of those nasty um, spines coming out. So that's one of the things we'll do in the training is really work on being able to do plant identification um, throughout all of the stages. In the bottom left, um, we have um, all different pictures on the left um, of Dalmatian toad flax. And it's pretty easy to recognize when it has the big kind of blue green leaves on it, um, but, or the flower. But when we get down to the young seedlings in the bottom row, um, we've got, that's a whole bunch of very young um, Dalmatian toad flax seedlings, and they look a whole lot like the um, stalks and leaves of um, blue flax to the right there. And so that's blue flax in flower, but when you get, it looks nothing like toad flax, but when you get down to it, young toad flax and young blue flax, they look real similar. And one of the ways you can tell those apart is actually even the texture and the feel of the plant. Um, to the right then we have, um, on the bottom we have, um, Cheek grass or downy brome, and that is very hairy. Um, one of the things you can see with that plant is it's real easy to pull up. It's an annual and it will offer you no resistance as you go to pull it out of the soil. We do have a whole lot of native bromes, um, most of them perennial, that are quite similar in appearance, um, usually not quite as spiny, and most of them um, with a big healthy underground root system at the base. So if you go to tug on those, they, it would be really hard to pull one of those out of the ground as easily as you can. Um, so those are just some of the lookalikes. And so that's one of the things we'll work on in the training is making sure that you know the difference. Um, another thing is proper tools and equipment. We all have our own favorites, um, but some of the things we'll cover is the personal protective equipment to wear, um, what kind of tools to have, um, a sharp shovel, um, something that has a flat edge on the top of the shovel. So when you push with your um, foot, you're not just cutting through your shoes with your shovel edge. Um, a hori, hori, a lot of people like that as a tool. A um, geology pick or rock hammer, which is the one with the blue handle that works really well with getting entire root systems out, particularly in rocky hard soils. And um, frequently loppers or hand pruners. Mm. Next one. Um, trainings will also consider um, what methods to use. Um, and so the different methods we'll look at are to remove the entire plant, which could be done sometimes when you're lucky by just pulling or frequently by digging. Um, soil solarization, and you'll see the picture in the upper right hand corner, shows a huge patch of scotch thistle. Um, on the, Arbor I mean, the Museum of Northern Arizona's land. And um, at this um, place, Sot actually covered um, all of the plants with this clear plastic and um, got the edges sealed down so heat would build up underneath it. And we found out that it was a really successful way of killing a huge patch of young scotch thistle that otherwise we would have been digging at for hours. Um, sheet mulch is real similar to that, and on the bottom left you can see in um, first stands of things like cheat grass, where you just have a gazillion of them and it would take you your whole life to pull them, um, and nothing really that you want to save in the patch. You can um, put down cardboard, um, put mulch on top of that. And then over time that will just choke out the cheat grass and you can plant right through that or seed something else on top of it. And then frequently as a last result, when you come up resort, when you come upon something to the right, um, like this scotch thistle, you can see it's in flower and it's even starting to go into seed. Say you don't have a lot of time and you don't want those seeds to spread. You can clip off your seed heads or remove the top of the plants. And sometimes with annuals, it will set them back so that they don't bloom anymore at all. They just die or sometimes at least it will buy you some time to come back and treat the plant.
Um, another thing, quality control, when we're doing the project, we just want to make sure that you're familiar with the root system of the plants that you have so that you can know that you are getting the entire root system. Um, the cheek grass on the bottom left, you can see once again, has this teeny, teeny little root system, very, very easy to pull. Um, the next plant, I'm not even sure which one it is, but it has a big taproot going down. And so unless you get that entire taproot, um, the plant is likely to come back. And then the plants, two plants to the right, which are um, diffuse knapweed and Dalmatian toad flax. You can see how they're all connected to one another. So all of the separate tops are connected by this long rhizomatous root system. And so frequently you find yourself having to get rid of all of those and the attachments between them to actually get rid of the plant. These videos will demonstrate the various methods of weed removal and some of the tools that you may use. When working outdoors, it's important to stay hydrated and to keep cool by wearing appropriate clothing and gloves. Okay, well, we're looking today at some of the tools that you might want to take out with you when you're weeding, and everybody has their preferences. Um, but when you go out, there's a bunch of tools that will work for you. Um, in terms of a shovel, the best thing is usually a shovel that has a nice point on it. So you want a pointed shovel. If you know how to sharpen your tools or you can get sharp tools, it will make your life a lot easier. Um, so a point is nice and also a shovel that has some of these flat rests here because when you go to dig, that's really gonna protect your foot during the course of the day. If your shovel doesn't have those, you'll have an edge against your foot and it'll be really uncomfortable after a while. This is a very nice shovel. Um, sometimes you can get a smaller version of this one to use too, so it's not so much to carry around. Um, but having the point and the place to put your feet is important. And then other digging tools that people tend to like are a hand trowel. And this hand trowel is pretty good. What you really want to make sure with your hand trowel that it has a comfortable handle for you that it has a point and also for Flagstaff area weeds, you just need to make sure that your blade on your, on your little hand trowel is made of stainless steel or some forged really heavy duty metal because any, one of, any of the ones that are flimsy will just frequently buckle as soon as you hit a rock. So a nice sturdy sh hand trowel can be good. Um, a lot of people love the Hori Hori for digging. Um, and so it has, um, you gotta be careful with this one. Definitely have your gloves with you at all times because this is very sharp. It's got serrated edges and a point, but this can be really good for getting into the ground with really hard to dig weeds and getting out that whole root system. Um, my favorite is the geology pick. Um, you can buy these and they're usually, well, they're about 30, 40 bucks, but they'll last a lifetime. Um, and these are also really good for making sure you can get out the root system or even giving a really steady whack to just get out something that has a short tap root but that has having some resistance because your ground is dry. Um, it's usually also good to have some kind of um, hand pruners, loppers, and those will come in handy. Sometimes you need to cut things down so you can even get a place where you can safely hold it or cut off the seed heads and bag them. And so the loppers or little good sharp hand pruning tools will work. Um, if you have any seeds and you're working and you're gonna be able to scratch in some seeds, if you have native seeds from the area or a native grass seed, um, usually if you can bring seeds out, that could be nice because you can sprinkle in a few every time you remove a weed, scratch them into the ground, step it down, and maybe those seeds will grow to replace your weed, which will be really nice. And um, then usually some kind of bag or container to put your weeds in. Well, we're standing here in a nice patch of mixed native grasses and diffuse knapweed, and diffuse knapweed is one of our target species and a really important one to get rid of because it can spread and it puts out chemicals that will ultimately keep the other native plants and plants from growing. 
So the first thing when you get to the area is you want to look around and recognize your target species and make sure you know what you're looking at. And in the case of diffuse knapweed, like many other um, plants and particularly weeds, you've got different life stages and so it really helps to recognize those. Um, in this case, we even have last year's seeds and they're probably still some attached. I'm going to always take anything with seeds, for, like diffuse knapweed, I'm going to bag and take away because if we just cut them and throw them down, the seeds will mature and it won't really do any great good that we pulled the weed. Um, so here with diffuse knapweed, we've got two things. We've got the tall adult stage and here you can see it's kind of um, like a candelabra. Um, the stems go off kind of at almost right angles to the plant and that's a really good characteristic if you get into mixed stands with native asters. One of the things I like to do is start out with a shovel because if you can dig with a shovel, you don't have to bend all the time or squat, it's a lot easier on your back and depending on your soil conditions, you know, you can sometimes get away with things. The, this one we can see it's hard digging, we'll see if we can get all the root because on the knapweed it has a long taproot and if you leave the root um, it'll come back again and try to get the whole root. So this one, that worked, it didn't have a super deep root and that's actually all that was there anymore. So we were lucky on that one, you can see it's got a small root system um, and we're going to put it in our bag. Um, let's see, um, where did our, <laughs> I just stepped on our life stage, life stage here. Okay, well then, so another way that you can get rid of these weeds is with the geology pick, or people call it a rock hammer, they have lots of names, but you can definitely use those. And usually with those, the technique is you kind of begin to loosen the soil around the plant and for me it always helps if I can to be holding it upright and you can see okay <laughs> bad job <laughs> missed the bottom of the root um, huh. it's interesting it's just breaking off well never had that happen before <laughs> short taproot yeah short taproot I like to get a big root system though but maybe it's as they get this far along they really begin to yeah they're just coming up like that mm -hmm. so it's interesting these seem to have a pretty short taproot I'm not really breaking it off and it appears that as they go to flowering they're taking all their energy and putting it up into the flower stalks and that root's not as tenacious as it is earlier on in this plant's lifestyle um, so we want to try to get the taproot and we want to make sure to bag them um, so the other stage of these we have when you're looking around is the little rosette stage of the knapweed. And so those, some of those are right here and here. Um, so the first thing you want to do is just get your ID, whatever you're using to help you ID plants or ask somebody, but make sure that you're getting the right plant. Um, and I think Barb's done something in this presentation about um, lookalikes. But this is a rosette of diffuse knapweed. Um, and at that stage, they're usually pretty easy to get out. Um, if you keep loosening the soil around it, you end up kind of teasing out the whole root. And so those guys can be really easy to get out. And of course, if we get them out at this stage, um, it's going to really make our job easier um, to get rid of them entirely. So that is a rosette of diffuse knapweed. And then you just want to make sure to put them all in your bag. Um, if you're out and you see other seed heads, you can bag those too. Um, and just, we won't leave anything behind. Okay, so. If you do have some native seed along at this point in time, it helps to kind of smooth out the soil. Um, let me get my seed. Over there, probably. Oh, here it is. The 
hardest thing is to not lose everything you have. <laughs> and then um, I usually take my gloves off for this so I can feel what I'm doing. And you want to just take a little seed. In this case, I'm using a native aster. Um, and then once you get it in, just gently rub the soil over it. Step on it so it'll help keep it down until some moisture comes. And voila, hopefully next year, not only will you not have a diffuse knapweed, but you'll have a nice native plant or so to take its place. Large areas of weeds should be bagged and disposed of properly. Please contact us for methods of disposal. Well, our next um, target species that we're looking for is Dalmatian toad flax, and here's a kind of a mid-sized one. They can get quite big or they can be tiny, but this one um, has the yellow flowers, so it's really easy to spot, and then when you spot them, always just look around when you pull one. Just keep looking out in a radius, and that's a really good way to make sure you're getting them all. So for this one, um, I think I'm gonna use my pick just because I like the pick a lot of you might like the shovel better um, they're rhizomatous so they have underground roots so sometimes you want to try and get the whole thing which means as you dig or as you um, use the pick you want to start following the direction the root is going on and um, try to get the whole root um, a lot of people say okay if you don't get the root at least you're depleting the carbohydrate reserves of the plants and if you repeat for a few years um, it will get rid of the plant um, so you can see this plant has a doesn't have a really extensive root system yet and that's kind of borne out by the fact that we don't see any more attached to it i'm going to try to find a bigger plant um, so that we can get a better root system. Let's try this one. So here you can see there's a lot of toad flax next to each other and there's a really good chance they're going to be connected to each other. Okay. So sometimes when the earth's hard like this, it really helps to rock that point of the shovel in there. Um, and then to begin to pull up. And as you go, you can feel um, whether or not you don't want to cut through the roots if you can avoid it. And then pull them off, shake off the seed, and you can see we pretty much got that root. So once again, it doesn't have runners, but it certainly has a more extensive root system than some. Um, so once again, when you're done with that, it's really good to um, pack your soil back down. It'll take the native plants that are around and get their roots back in the soil, and it will maybe keep weed seeds from coming in. Sometimes you have to do a little clearing to get to your target species. In this case, just to get to my toad flax, I'm going to pull out the salsify, which you can tell is a salsify because when you break it, it has milky sap coming out of the stems. Um, and then now I've got some more small, um, small toad flax here. And these can be really easy to get out, I hope. I'm trying to not get my natives when I'm getting it, but try to get all the roots. And then these, it usually helps if you kind of pull gently. You can see the root system starting to spread, and so getting all that will help you. Um, in terms of these plants, this one doesn't have any flowers on it, and so we can just probably throw it back down on the ground. When we have um, flowers on a plant, if we're able to, we can bag. Um, we're not having seeds in the field that we're seeing right now, but they will be brown like these things here. If you have anything looking like developed seed pods, the best thing to do is going to be to take your toad flax away and bag it, get it off site so that there's no chance that you're going to be spreading it by leaving it there. Okay, well, right now we're going to look at um, scotch thistle 
and talk about how to pull that. Um, so the first thing that's really important when you find scotch thistle, it's gray, it's got these very hairy, almost white leaves, um, and that will really help you recognize it. But there are some native thistles that you can get confused with, especially in their smaller stages. And so you really want to note that on our weedy thistles, the stems, I cannot really touch it. Um, they have um, both, they have like wings on them and they have thorns coming out on them. And so you couldn't with the bare hand take this and hold this. It would be really painful. Almost all of the natives have just a round stem. And so if you could grab the stem with your bare hands, it's probably not the weedy thistle and you should leave them because they're very, very important to hundreds of insect species and pollinators. Um, and birds too. But anyway, this is definitely scotch thistle. Um, and here we've got a small one. Um, it's past the rosette stage where you would just have the um, felty, pointy leaves against the ground. It's already starting to have one flower, but it's a small one. And then here we have one that's large. And as you can see, this is going to have many, many flowers and many, many seeds. So it's really important that when we get rid of these, we take them away um, because asters can frequently develop. It's aster family, thistles and other things in that family can develop really quickly and still go to seed. So we're going to take it away with us and make sure we don't leave any flower heads. So let's start on the little one and see about digging that. I think the shovel is probably going to work well here. This is um, a deep alluvial field here and you'll frequently find scotch thistle in these um, soils. Um, so frequently they're easier to dig than some of the rocky ones that we'll see. So this one you can tend to just go down. Oh, this is beautiful. This is like how you want to dig it. This in your soil. Try to grab it. Ouch. You might want leather gloves. Shake off the soil. And voila. I'll put it down in my bag. And lo and behold, right next to it, I've got another one waiting to take its place. And so here's a really little one. Um, and you can see that was right underneath that one. So sometimes you'll find that. So if you find any little ones coming up and you want to pull those. This one has absolutely no tendency to flowering. So I think I can just throw it down. If you want to bag it, go ahead. And then once again, after we're done, we can pack the soil. Um, I'm not going to put seed in here today, um, but if you do have seed, that's the stage where you'd sprinkle in a little bit of seed and put it down. Oh, I do see. We actually have the rosette stage here. So the more you look, the more you find. And that's usually a really good way to do them is first we could look across the field and see the big tall one standing up. And then as we get close to it, we can go outward in a radius and see that there's more of them. So here, there's just a rosette with um, no flower stock. And so you can see, we're gonna have, get a lot of these in a small area quickly. Uh, this is not gonna be as nice as rocks around them. So that's Oh, I love picks. And try to loosen it. Came right up. And that was my thistle. So once you do an area, it's always good to note the area if you can visit it the next year. If you can come back later in the season to your same area, sometimes you'll find out that things you missed will come up and you can get them out. And then if you can come back and visit a second year or tell us, the grant administrators, to come back. If you can't make it, we'll try to get other people to do it. Then um, we can really try to get these out because sometimes they can take multiple years. And they can be all sizes. Look, there's another really teeny one. And once again, these we can throw down because they're not going to flower. So our big one can be kind of a logistic nightmare. Um, you can try to dig under them 
and sometimes if they're this size you can do that sometimes you'll find these will be as tall as I am they're really hard to move in on and so for this one we're just going to take our lopper and make it a little easier to work on we're going to cut off the top and I'm going to bag that whole thing because they can even um, once you cut them if they're this far along they can develop flowers in the nodes of leaves and I'm going to bag that Ow. <laughs> definitely wear your gloves and now we can get to this rosette really easily and bend over get close without getting stuck etc and we're going to cross our fingers here and hope that our soil is nice and um, soft. And then we can get the thistle out, get a hold of it, shake out and leave that beautiful rich soil. Look at that. Every gardener wants that soil. And then once again, into an area, you're out hiking, or you don't have time to weed it, you may not have time to get back to it for a while, and you actually can um, cut off just the flowering portions of your thistle to slow it dropping seeds. So if you think that you're not going to be able to get it right away, you can cut off seed heads, and we'll do that. So here's another scotch thistle, and this one you can see the flowers are maturing, so this one's getting very close to um, forming seeds. So let's say I'm out on my bicycle, I have a little day backpack, I haven't brought a bag, but I see this and I think it's about to go to seed. I can go on it and cut off ow, <laughs> the flowering stems, um, put them in my backpack, take it away and then try to remember to come back and get it because it's still, when you do this, it will encourage all the other um, places that it can form flowers to, um, to set them. But it does slow down the plant and it's really quick. So you could take this away, probably represents a couple thousand <laughs> seeds that aren't going to hit the ground. And then try to come back and revisit it within a bag within a week or two or try to get someone to do that. That can slow it down if you have a huge weed infestation as far as the eye can see. You can start cutting off the flowers if you don't think you're going to be able to treat the whole thing. If you do find a huge infestation it would be really good if you let um, Sheila Marie at the Arboretum know because we can try to direct a crew if you're running into something that's too big to deal with on a neighborhood basis or an individual basis, we can um, try to direct some resources to it. If not first year of the grant, the second year. So this is another one of our weeds you might encounter here. Um, and it's just coming into the area heavily. Um, so it's one that if you find it could be really good to get rid of. Um, it's called jointed goat grass. And, um, there is, most of these have turned brown already, but there is one green plant here. Um, now I'm going to, this is really good. We've talked about weeds being annual weeds or perennial weeds. And the really good thing about jointed goat grass is that it's an annual, which means in most situations you can just grab it and pull it up. Most annuals, if you leave a little bit of, they have really limited root systems. And so there's not much to pull, so they come out easily. Soft soil it usually will pretty much pull up and then you definitely want to bag this one because you can see that the seeds will, um, they're mature and you can see here these long jointed stems that give the plant the jointed part of its name and you can see that these break off into segments. Um, kind of like some kind of sweet roll or 
Tootsie Roll candy bar. And so you can see each one of the segments is a seed. So it's very important that we take these, put them in the bag and take them away. If you do need to use a pick on a heavier soil, once again, you'll see um, they pop right out. There's, and you can see there's almost no root system on these plants. So that shows you that it's an annual. And this has a little um, cheatgrass or brome in here. We're not going to worry that we got that with it because we really don't want that. Either. I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the loose ends that we'll um, cover in person in the workshops, but also um, this is a resource for you that you can go back and look at. Or if you don't make it to a workshop, you can think of these things and it will help you um, do your weed work because um, invasive plant control is a really wonderful cause. It's so necessary and it's so good that um, we have so many people involved who really want to help take care of our earth and um, take care of our plant communities for the benefit of all life. Um, but sometimes it can be overwhelming. There's a whole lot of weeds out there, um, even just within our little um, 5,200 um, acre area. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is prioritizing your weeding activities. Um, we have some of the target species, um, particularly some of those ones that Barb showed that are you know, really high priority species. And the other thing is, is there's really hope that we can get rid of them all, particularly in an area and keep them from spreading. Um, and so when we have a whole lot of weeds in an area, um, sometimes it helps to only do one species at a time and prioritize and decide which one do I want to get now. For instance, right now in June, the cheatgrass is pretty much already um, hardened off, it's dropped its seeds, and so it's ugly if um, you can get it out to um, reduce your fire risk, but sometimes it's a whole lot of work to try to get out big areas of it when it's in this state, and the seeds have already dropped. So in terms of cheatgrass, we usually want to think about going out when, when there's been recent moisture or early in the season and getting it before it goes to seed. That's um, really effective. Um, with the other weeds that we've got, um, with the thistles, um, you really want to first go after the ones that are producing um, flowers and um, are going to be producing seeds. So number one would be getting to the ones that have seeds on them, possibly clipping off those flowers and bagging them. And then if you have time, then working on the big mature um, upright thistle plants. If there are rosettes in, in an area and you can handle getting everything, then you can get the rosettes at the same time um, and that um, takes care of it all. But if you're pressed for time and feeling overwhelmed, you can simply go for the mature flowering stage of the plants and know that the young rosettes aren't going to bloom usually until the next year. Um, diffuse knapweed is a really high priority species um, and when you work with it, um, you definitely want to try to um, get rid of the tops of the plant. Um, so if your soil is really, really hard and you can't get to it um, easily to get the whole plant off, the first thing that you want to do is work on getting the whole thick flowering stems off. Sometimes diffuse knapweed after it blooms, the whole plant will die, um, but frequently the rosette will revitalize again and have lower to the ground flowering stems. So you do want to then come back and get the roots if you can't get them at a first pass. And you definitely want to bag anything coming from diffuse knapweed that has any um, mature growth on it that has the priority to produce flowers and seeds because that plant will do that. Um, Dalmatian toad flax is another high priority species. And of course, if you're out there and you see the young plants coming up, you can get them. But of course, most important are the mature ones, the ones that are going to flower, that are flowering. And absolutely, um, first priority is to get the seed heads off so they don't fall. Um, other weeds, um, we'll show some for different areas, um, particularly at the workshops. But another priority tends to be when new invasive species are coming into an area. 
Um, so something like moth mullen, um, I think that Barb has a picture of it earlier on in the show, but I'm not sure, but we'll show it if it's in a neighborhood when we have the workshop. Some of these plants, you just want to make sure that if there's only 10 or 12 or 14 or 15 around and you can get them, you can prevent an entire weed infestation from beginning, taking hold, and then spreading throughout the community over the years. So the other priority would be to find things that are new coming into areas and try to keep them out. Um, that's a really easy and important thing to do. Um, once you've removed weeds, you want to think about restoring the treated area with native seeds and plants um, to prevent weed reinfestation. Um, so when you pull weeds, that's great. You stop the weeds from being there. You stop um, having a new seed source, but frequently there can be seeds left in the soil um, or seeds that can blow in from other areas. And so the best defense about that is to get healthy native plants growing where the weeds have been removed. Um, so when you um, remove your weeds, after each weed, you normally will tamp the soil down um, and cover up the hole so that it's less receptive to have seeds um, land on it. Um, but what you do want to do next with native seeds is you want to scratch them in um, and get them installed in there. Um, so frequently, um, we have some seed we can provide. Another way to get seed is to look around the area and see if there are um, seeds of grasses and native plants you recognize growing in similar areas that you can collect and plant in, this, in the um, places you've removed the weeds. So how do you recognize that um, seeds are mature? Um, usually the parts of the plant will turn to a tan or a brown color. Um, if there are seed capsules, they'll split open. Um, if there are fruits um, on plants, they will be mature and sometimes you can just mash those up and, and scratch them into the soil. But first you want to make sure that you have mature seed. Um, so seeds that are mature usually are firm um, and tan brown or black in color um, sometimes they're a little more colorful but they are never um, squishy um, light green um, empty feeling or milky um, those seeds are not ready yet so you have to make sure your seeds are mature um, if you do have them you can take about the equivalent of 10 per square foot scratch them into your soil um, scratch a little soil back over them and walk on them you have the option of doing that at the time when you're weeding, um, which can work if seeds are present and if you have time to do it, or you can come back later during monsoons or um, come in and seed the area on top of snow. And frequently those seeds will go down through the snow. The snow will help water them. They'll get the cold treatment they need for the winter and plants can develop easily in that way. Um, if you're going to use plants, what you need to think about is that plants need water to establish and our monsoon can be very unreliable. So in terms of using plants, you want to plant um, native plants during times of um, very nice moist soil and regular rainfall, or you really need to be able to um, water them on your own, which means that they need to be close into your home or at a place where you have a water source. Um, and we do have some plants available. So if you have a situation that seems like you could use some plants, particularly in your own yard where you're pulling out the weeds and replacing them, we'd love to help you select the right plants and um, help you figure out how to get them in the ground. Once you've removed weeds, you want to think about restoring the treated area with native seeds and plants um, to prevent weed reinfestation. Um, so when you pull weeds, that's great. You stop the weeds from being there. You stop um, having a new seed source, but frequently there can be seeds left in the soil um, or seeds that can blow in from other areas. And so the best defense about that is to get healthy native plants growing where the weeds have been removed. Um, so when you um, remove your weeds, 
After each weed, you normally will tamp the soil down um, and cover up the hole so that it's less receptive to have seeds um, land on it. Um, but what you do want to do next with native seeds is you want to scratch them in um, and get them installed in there. Um, so frequently, um, we have some seed we can provide. Another way to get seed is to look around the area and see if there are um, seeds of grasses and native plants you recognize growing in similar areas that you can collect and plant in, these, in the um, places you've removed the weeds. So how do you recognize that um, seeds are mature? Um, usually the parts of the plant will turn to a tan or a brown color. Um, if there are seed capsules, they'll split open. Um, if there are fruits um, on plants, they will be mature and sometimes you can just mash those up and, and scratch them into the soil. But first you want to make sure that you have mature seed. Um, so seeds that are mature usually are firm um, and tan brown or black in color um, sometimes they're a little more colorful but they are never um, squishy um, light green um, empty feeling or milky um, those seeds are not ready yet so you have to make sure your seeds are mature um, if you do have them you can take about the equivalent of 10 per square foot scratch them into your soil um, scratch a little soil back over them and walk on them you have the option of doing that at the time when you're weeding, um, which can work if seeds are present and if you have time to do it, or you can come back later during monsoons or um, come in and see the area on top of snow. And frequently those seeds will go down through the snow. The snow will help water them. They'll get the cold treatment they need for the winter and plants can develop easily in that way. Um, if you're going to use plants, what you need to think about is that plants need water to establish and our monsoon can be very unreliable. So in terms of using plants, you want to plant um, native plants during times of um, very nice moist soil and regular rainfall or you really need to be able to um, water them on your own which means that they need to be close into your home or at a place where you have a water source. Um, and we do have some plants available so if you have a situation that seems like you could use some plants particularly in your own yard where you're pulling out the weeds and replacing them we'd love to help you select the right plants and um, help you figure out how to get them in the ground well once you've um, removed weeds and potentially added some cedar plants to the area the final step to ensure um, success of your weed removal is to return and revisit the weeded areas. So um, when can we do that? Usually it's a good time when you're done for the day, just look around and, and make sure that you've gotten all of the weeds that you were setting out to get. Um, later on, you're gonna wanna go back and revisit your treated areas um, to remove new growth. Um, there can be new growth, particularly with some of the plants like Dalmatian toad flax with the spreading root systems. Frequently, you will get new top growth, but it's usually less vigorous um, and is depleting the root supply as you go. So you wanna go back and remove, uh, remove any top growth that has come back from the roots and also remove any new weeds that may have um, appeared in the area from the soil seed bank or have blown in. Um, when can you visit? Usually um, the end of the rainy season is a really good time to come and see what's come up with the rains. Um, after the rainy season, not much will come up. So um, at the end of the season is a really good time to come and look at an area and see the success of your efforts. And then um, each year, you want to go revisit and retreat each site. Um, usually the spring will bring up some new weeds, maybe ones you haven't seen yet um, as the season warms up and we approach summer and the monsoons, a different set of species will come up and after the monsoons, you can have yet more growth. And so each of those three times will help you um, to get a handle on what's in an area and get rid of the weeds. Um, for the purpose of this grant, we're working 
working on this for two years, um, but if you're able to um, encourage your neighbors and friends get together and come and take care of your areas, you'll find out that each year it will get easier and easier um, and you'll have fewer and fewer weeds and more and more native plants. So you've um, removed your weeds, you've um, come back and revisited, um, you've removed more weeds that come in, you've reported your time um, that you've spent doing this, and um, you've reported the areas you've treated, and we're done here. Um, great work. Yeah, um, you'll know at the end of this it's been some work, um, but usually quite satisfying. You've helped create a healthy and natural area and prevented the spread of invasive non-native plants into our forest and our neighborhoods, which is the purpose of this grant. And hopefully you've learned some really good skills in terms of plant identification and project management um, so that you can take these skills and um, share them with others and and, um, use them for the rest of your life. So thanks a lot. We would like to provide you with incentives for participating in this project. First of all, you'll get that feel good feeling for doing something good for the environment and your neighborhoods. Second, we're gonna give you a vinyl sticker you can put on your water bottle or your bicycle or your car. Also, we are going to provide you with any assistance with identifying weeds on your property if you have any, and we can provide you with native plants and seeds for restoration while these supplies last and also while time allows. Thank you so much for your participation in this project. For more information, please contact us at the emails below.